for a really long time, um, physicists thought that Newton's laws um, were absolute um, and that they described everything in nature um, perfectly. But as um, science progressed and we were able to measure um, things that were moving much faster than um, we could normally observe with the naked eye, um, it became apparent that Newton's laws may not describe everything per perfectly. Um, in 1905, Albert Einstein, he was 26 years old, so probably not much older um, than a grade 11 or a grade 12 student, was able to demonstrate in a paper that Newton's second law, which is F equals MA, um, became invalid at speeds close to the speed of light. And this was really um, part of the beginning of special relativity. Um, but really, you know, before anyone can delve into the study of special relativity, um, we need to look at um, relative motion and kind of ordinary Galilean relativity. Um, and, and that's what this lesson is devoted to. It's looking at relative motion in one dimension and in two dimensions. So consider um, the image to the right. Um, this is kind of a famous um, image, and it's, it's of course, um, you know, used in all kinds of different um, examples, but basically, you know, you look at this and, and your brain will tell you that this is an image of either a young woman or an old lady. And depending on what you see, um, are you right or are you wrong? And of course, the answer is, is that, you know, it doesn't matter what you see, you are correct because um, there's a dual image here. And if you look at it long enough, you can start to see, um, you know, whatever you didn't notice first. It may take a little bit of time, um, but it certainly is there. Both images are there. And so, you know, that's exactly the point, is that depending on your point of view, both answers are correct. Okay, so each of you sees the world differently in a slightly different way, um, and that's because of your past experiences and what your perceptions are, and that's exactly what relativity is all about. It's about two people seeing two different things, or sorry, ex excuse me, two different people seeing the exact same thing, but, but just in two different ways. So in physics, a frame of reference is the point of view from which we observe motion. Okay, so, you know, your frame of reference is you sitting there, and it's how you observe motion to be happening. And it could, uh, it could vary depending on whether you're moving or whether you're standing still or et cetera, et cetera. And as it turns out, all motion is relative. Um, and this is why... Um, we always measure motion relative to a frame of reference. And, of course, if you've taken an introductory course in physics, you'll know that you always set a frame of reference at the beginning of any motion problem or force problem, and you kind of say, this is up, and, you know, this is the positive up direction, this is the positive um, kind of left or right direction. And so here's an example of a rowboat um, where we have to, where we really have to look at a frame of reference. So this is kind of a classic example. Here's an observer on shore. Okay, and he's looking at a boat that's uh, far off in the distance. Okay, and the boat is moving with some velocity, um, in, in this case, in the right direction. And so, let's say we flip the whole picture around, and now we want to look at the example of, okay, well, here's now a person in a boat, and so this is the observer in the boat. What does that person see? Well, of course, if you're in the boat and you're looking towards the shore, you don't see yourself moving necessarily, you see the land going by you. Okay, so that's kind of like a classic example of relative motion. And we, you know, we can describe it algebraically, but that's not necessarily important. It's just that, you know, the velocity of the boat in one frame of reference is equal to the negative velocity of the guy on the shore in the other frame of reference. And so both situations are mathematically and physically correct, and they serve as a very, very simple example of one-dimensional relative motion. But when we get into two dimensions, things get a little bit more complex. And so we have different notations, and of course, no matter what course you're taking or no matter where you're studying physics, you're going to have all kinds of different notations um, for kind of these, these two-dimensional vectors. And so um, VOG is... Um, O stands for object, M for medium, 
and G for ground. So here, VOG um, would be the velocity of the object with respect to the ground. Okay, so whatever object is moving, this is its velocity with respect to the ground. VMG is the velocity of the medium through which the object is moving with respect to the ground. And VOM would be the velocity of the object with respect to the medium. Now, you know, certainly what, what you'll see in this lesson is that we're using a medium such as air, if we're talking about an airplane, or we're using water, if we're talking about boats. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a medium. It, you know, it could be object one and object two, the velocity of one object with respect to the ground, the velocity of a second object with respect to the ground. And then the final velocity would be, you know, the final one here would be the velocity of the object with respect to each other. And, and so we could replace these types of notations with that. But the best way to learn how all of this fits together is to look at a few examples of classic relative motion questions, right? So the boat crossing the river or air navigation. And this really is pretty much a, um, a review of classic relative motion questions from, from introductory physics. So here we go. We've got example one. This is George. He wants to cross the Grand River. He hops into his canoe and he paddles straight north towards Waterloo with a velocity of five kilometers per hour. He's a pretty good canoeer. If the Grand River is five kilometers wide, how long does it take him to reach the other side? So there's no current. There's nothing going on here. Here's a little diagram. Okay, so here's Kitchener. And across the river, there's, there's Waterloo. And so there's the canoe that he hops in five kilometers per hour. And of course, the distance is five kilometers. So we say, okay, well, distance is equal to velocity times time. And we get five kilometers equals five T. And we can solve very simply that time is, of course, one hour. And so we can say, okay, well, then it would take him one hour to cross. Okay, so further then, here's example two. On another day, George notices that there's a current flowing down the Grand River due east at two kilometers per hour. So now he's in his boat, but now there's a current. Okay, so similar diagram, very similar diagram, you know, setting this up, but we've got a current that we introduce of two kilometers an hour. Okay. So the first question here is, how does the current affect the time required to cross the river? And so the answer is, well, is it going to affect it at all? He, he still has to cross five kilometers. He's still traveling at five kilometers per hour in that direction. The current may be pushing him downstream, but it really doesn't make a whole heck of a lot of difference to how long it's going to take him to cross. And of course, well, here, we've got our standard notations. The velocity of the boat with respect to the ground is what, you know, we don't know. And the water with respect to the ground is 2 kilometers per hour. The velocity of the boat with respect to the water, 5 kilometers per hour. So this is just some formalizing here. But, of course, the answer to A is, is that, well, George still paddles at 5 kilometers per hour. And the river is still 5 kilometers wide. So, really, it still takes an hour to cross that river. He doesn't end up in the same spot, though. And, of course, that's question number B, is how far is it from Waterloo to Guelph? Well, now we know if it takes him an hour to cross the river, he's going to be going. It's going to take him an hour. So how far downstream is that current going to push him? And so we know that distance is equal to velocity times time. And in this case, the velocity that we're talking about is the velocity of the water with respect to the ground, because that's how much it's pushing him downstream. And so we have two kilometers per hour times an hour. He's going to end up two kilometers downstream. And we've said that that's Guelph. And whether you think that Waterloo is two kilometers per hour, or sorry, two kilometers from Guelph, is, you know, it remains to be seen. But anyways, basically, with that, that's the answer to the question using the numbers that we've got. So on a third day of canoeing, George decides to head to Waterloo instead of Guelph. So he, now he doesn't want to end up in Guelph. He doesn't want to let the river push him downstream. So the conditions are the exact same as they were in the previous example. But now, let's find the direction that the boat has to be pointed in order to end up in Waterloo. Okay, so here's a very similar diagram again. But now what you'll notice is, is that really, he's got to angle himself 
into the current so that the current will push him back and he'll end up going straight across the river. And it's this angle theta that you can see here in our triangle diagram that we want to find. Now, of course, we know several of these variables, so this shouldn't be too difficult. So looking at the tri tri diagram here, at the triangle, we can solve it using trigonometry. We can certainly solve for theta. And we see that sine theta is equal to 2 over 5 because the velocity of the water with respect to the ground, VWG, is 2, and the velocity of the boat with respect to the water is 5, right? So our same numbers. And as it turns out, theta, or the angle that he must point at, upstream is equal to 24 degrees. For B, what is the ground velocity of the boat? So now we actually want to know, okay, if he's paddling at 5 kilometers per hour, in an, in an angle up to an angle of 24 degrees, what, what's his boat actually doing? What's his boat actually traveling with respect to the ground? And that's that, that's that unknown variable that we haven't found it. We can, of course, use the Pythagorean theorem to find this. We could also use trigonometry. But basically, we know that 5 squared is equal to 2 squared plus the velocity of the boat with respect to the ground squared. Now be very careful because in this example, this is a, you know this uses a right angle triangle, and certainly um, if you're doing example problems um, in the textbook or um, you know wherever, you will see that often these are not right angle triangles, and uh, so you can't you wouldn't be able to use Pythagorean theorem. So that's just a little caution there is to be very careful because often these are not uh, right angles, and and you'd have to use sine law or cosine law in order to solve. But here. We've made things simple, and so the velocity of the boat with respect to the ground is 4.6 kilometers per hour. The final question then is how long now does it take the boat to reach the other shore? And of course here, we use our distance equals velocity times time, and we sub in the numbers and we find it takes a little bit more than an hour. And of course it would, because he's traveling. Uh, in, in a direction that's not straight across the river. So 1.1 hours. Final example here is one um, that's very, very similar to the last. Of course, Criminal Minds, great television show. But the BAU team from Criminal Minds needs to fly in the FBI private jet due north from Washington to Belleville in order to profile an unsub. There's a wind from the west at 20 kilometers per hour and their private jet can only fly at a velocity of 150 kilometers per hour in still air. Maybe it's just not that much of an emergency. Usually private jets go faster than that. Anyways, what's the plane's heading? In which direction should the pilot point the plane? And what's the plane's ground velocity? So we'll do a little diagram here. Here's Washington. Here's Belleville, Ontario. The BAU team must not rush for Canadians, but anyhow, so we have this uh, we have this triangle here that we've set up, and of course we can solve for theta again using um, trigonometry, very simple trigonometry. First, let's go through here velocity of the of the um, air with respect to the ground, so the wind is twenty kilometers per hour, and the velocity of the plane with respect to the air. So what it can do in still air is 150 kilometers per hour. And of course, we don't know the plane's velocity relative to the ground. But we would like to solve that eventually. So in the first case, let's use trigonometry. And we can solve for sine of phi, which is equal to 20 over 150. Phi is equal to about 7.7 .7 degrees. Okay, And then for, for part B... Um, we go into the Pythagorean theorem again. This is a right angle triangle, so um, you know the situation simplified a little bit. 150 squared equals 20 squared plus the velocity of the plane with respect to the ground squared, and we get 148.7 kilometers per hour due north. And so that's the plane's velocity with respect to the ground. And that is an introduction to relative motion. And of course, the next lesson we will look at Einstein's postulates and delve deeper into special relativity.